12. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgive you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, forgive our shortcoming that sometimes we are impatient and have a hard time to forgive other Lord. Be with us today and we ask you to be with Pastor Dana as he deliver your words to us that you will use him mightily, that you will give him strength, courage, and authority to carry out your word in truth, grace, and dignity. And as for us, Lord, that you will give us and soften our hearts to receive your words and also help us to be sensitive toward you that we will feel your presence among us. You are our great God and we are grateful for who you are. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Rosalina. When uh, my brother and I were, and sister and I were kids, teenagers, every once in a while, my mom and stepdad would get a wild hair and we'd go down to Izzy's Pizza Parlor a couple miles down the road. Izzy's Pizza. And my brother and I would just demolish these huge pizzas and stuff ourselves. And my mom would get the salad bar. And the most fun was in the back of the pizza parlor, they had some of those 1980s vintage video games, except they weren't vintage then, they were new, right? <laughs> so the, the, there were two sports involved. One is playing the video games and the other is getting mom to empty every last quarter out of her purse. Because <laughs> uh, she'd say, okay, here's some quarters. 
And I was, I was not much, a video, uh, much of a video gamer because I knew the value of a quarter and I knew how long I'd last at the Space Invaders and everything. And 15 seconds later, all my little guys are dead and the quarter's gone. Never get it back. But my brother, he knew how to make a quarter last. But even so, we'd, we'd play some video games. I'd watch him beat the Space Invaders and all that. And then back to mom, digging through the purse to find one more quarter. Because every quarter was a fresh start. Every time you put a quarter in that game, you got three new lives and new little guys to shoot the bad guys or spaceships or whatever it was. Now today we're going to hear about a brand new start that Jesus gives us every time that we pray. Every time we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus gives us a brand new start. That's his intention. And sometimes the Bible gives us the most basic statements, the most basic things that we can uh, here and not really understand how important they are. Like, for example, in the beginning, God created. That tends to go right over our heads, but if we've ever seen the result of not believing that, we'll know what a precious statement that is. Today we're going to hear something very, very simple related to the petition in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gives us when he says, pray like this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, it almost happened to me. Every Sunday at, in an average church like this, when we get to that part of the prayer, if we're going to say it out loud, forgive us our debts, there'll be a little bit of trespasses in there, a little bit of sins. Forgive us our debts, trespasses, sins, as we forgive those who debt trespass sin against us because we've got different traditions. So, uh, you know, for the sake of unity, let me say a quick word about that. To sin is to miss the mark. That's the Greek word for sin. Now, trespasses, sins, and debts all point to the same thing. They point to a perfect God calling us to rightly respond to him and his perfection and our failure to do that. But the type of failure that a sin is, is missing the mark. And it makes me think of my very first public guitar solo. Now, I did a little bit for you in church today just to kind of warm you up, but... Uh, when I was a high school kid and I discovered electric guitar and fell in love with it, I looked in the newspaper and the classified ads and there was an audition for a band and I got the part, lead guitar. I had this guitar that I was borrowing from the school, a 1970s Sunburst Stratocaster and it's amp and it was so great. And our first gig was playing at a middle school dance, the same middle school that I went to. So there I was reliving the trauma of the middle school dance. This time I was in the band get up, it's time for my guitar solo, everything is set up, and I play the loud, prominent note that is just one fret off, <laughs> a really sour note, and all the heads kind of turned like, what just happened? And there's this moment in time when the dance was frozen, and then it was over, and we went back to life, but that was missing the mark. If you ever want to miss the mark, you can try that. That's missing the mark. Sin is missing the mark. And trespasses, trespass is crossing a line. And if you want to know how easy it can be to cross a line, join a homeowners association. <laughs> Find out what the covenants are in your neighborhood. This one will make your skin crawl. There was a man who had a freak tragedy happen to him. An airplane crashed into his house, killed his wife and his baby son. You know, he's grieved. It's terrible. So he's going to rebuild his house. He rebuilds it, but the shingles don't perfectly match his neighbor's shingles, so he gets sued. He loses $70,000, he loses the house. Yep, if you want to know how easy it is to cross the line, just join a homeowners association. Well, sometimes we feel like that too, like, God, how could I ever be right with you? Your lines are so easy to cross, what can we do? Those are sins and trespasses what about debts you may think to yourself well you know god is gracious and god is good and kind uh, why would god look at me like i owe him something and and why would god look at everybody like we owe him something doesn't that seem kind of arrogant or mean well i want to tell you the foundational message that the scripture gives us that will help you understand what we owe God and how we owe God. It's kind of like in the beginning God created. 
it comes from Revelation chapter 4. There's a scene in heaven, and the heavenly creatures are praising God, and they're saying, Blessed are you to receive honor and glory and power and strength and so on, because you created all things, and by your will they are created. Now that word will in the Greek is a special kind of will. It means first will, or strongly desired will, best offer. It, it, it expresses the truth that God wanted everything to exist because God really wanted everything to exist. There's a falsehood that's taught that says you're an accident. There was a bunch of monkeys sitting at typewriters and eventually they came up with you, you know? Random things in the universe, stardust and energy and shazam. Here's this blue and green planet and you just happen to rise up out of the fungus. But that's not the story the Bible teaches. God said that he formed us and breathed his life into us. We're made in his image. And who is God? So hold on to that first thing. God made you because he really, really wanted to make you. You exist not as an accident, but because God loves you. He wants you to exist. Hold that together with this next thought. God created you, and who is God? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons and one substance. One God and three persons. God's very nature is community. God is love, the scripture says. The foundation of all the universe is love. The reason there's a creation is because love really, really desired for it to be there. God, who is love, really, really desired that you should exist. So the result is that what you owe God is love. Now I know the shortcut to this is just to ask Jesus. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He'll tell you, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. But I'm showing you the underpinnings of creation that lift up that truth to you. Sometimes we'll hear a command and say, well, that's a command because it's the command and I just do it because I do it. My heart's not in it, but I don't want to be in trouble. Today I'm asking you to have your heart in it because that's what God wants. That's what God deserves. That's what God is owed. It is God's strong desire that you would exist. And God made you so that you would receive his love and that you would love God in return. It's a beautiful thing. Now, not only did God create you and give you life, but God gave you second life if you've come to him in faith. If you become a believer, you've not only been created once, you've been created twice. You've not only been born, you've been born again. So you owe God double, double love. Now, the, the second creation that you experience is what Jesus had when he came off of the mountain after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, out of the desert, out of the wilderness, right down to the river where John the Baptist was. Jesus, who never did anything wrong, came and did what all the sinners were doing. He said to John, baptize me. I was thinking of the Randy Travis song this morning, Pray for the Fish. Have you ever heard that song? It's a great song. Pray for the fish. They don't know what's coming when the sin rolls off the likes of him. Right? When a sinner goes into the water and all that sin gets washed, that was the idea with John the Baptist. Uh, we're going to wash these sinners clean. They're going to repent. It was a baptism of repentance. Jesus didn't do anything. Why was he getting baptized? He was doing that so he could give you a gift. Hold that thought because after he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, came down like a dove in the form of a dove. And the voice of the Father said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Both the baptism and the voice were given to Jesus so that Jesus could give them to you. Now, uh, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, you didn't deserve it. You haven't paid God what you owe yet. You haven't done what would make you beloved in the eyes of a really, really holy, really loving, really good God. You haven't even given what you owe yet. You haven't even loved God yet in a way that's right. You haven't received God's love yet in a way that's right. And yet God's voice says to you, as if you were perfect, you, you're my beloved son, my beloved child. I'm well pleased with you. Now, I want you to imagine this, because this, I believe, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when you experience it, you suddenly feel peace. You, 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 you feel like, you wish you could drum something up to make you deserve it. 
but you can't. It's just there. It's settled on you. You're right. You're loved. You don't have anything against anybody else either. You're in a condition of being beloved. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to describe to you what it's really like so that you can know what you have or can have. This, I think, will really illustrate what a gift it is. When I was in the medium security prison doing an internship, um, a guy sent a note for me to come and talk with him. And we met in a cafeteria in a hallway, sat down at a desk, and he says, I want to tell you about my crime and why I did it and, w- and what God showed me. And he had committed a violent crime, and, and, and he could never do anything to repay what he did or make it right. But there was something in his face, a kind of meekness in his face. Now, if you walked in the hallways of that prison and heard the fierceness and the anger and the hatred and the swearing, and then you compared it to this man's face, you'd see that something had happened to him. He told me his crime, and he said, Then one day God said to me, I just heard God's voice. I don't know why. I heard God's voice, and God said, I love you, and I've always loved you. Now, where does that come from? He's a criminal. That came from Jesus. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God said that to him. That was his baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, imagine a man strapped to the chair. He's got a couple minutes left before he receives his lethal injection because he murdered in cold blood, and his whole life he's never felt remorse about it. He's just felt a little bit numb. And then in that moment, he hears the same thing because it can happen and it has happened. He hears, I love you and I've always loved you. (laughs) He He doesn't deserve that. He's never given God love. He's never received God's love. He's never paid his debt. He's getting it as a gift from Jesus because Jesus received it from the Father. And in that moment, he can forgive himself and he can forgive anyone else that's ever hurt him. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you're in that moment, it's not hard to forgive others. You're free. You're completely free of the entire process because it's not you. You don't deserve God's love. It's put on to you because Jesus received it first. He's your mediator. He did everything so he could give it to you. He died on the cross so he could give it to you. And Jesus received that love from the Father, really beloved love delight God's delight in him so when you uh, receive that when God when you receive the as a discipline but God invites us on a daily basis when we come to this point in the prayer to recognize that uh, we're made to love him and receive his love we owe that debt we're helpless we can't pay it but we can pray to him Father, forgive me my debt, as I have also forgiven. Now, maybe there's two translations, right? Because Rosalina uh, said, as we have also forgiven, and up here maybe it said, as we forgive our debtors. Was that the case? No. Okay, we had the same translation. Well, here's the thing. In some translations, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, like we say in the prayer, right? But in the Greek, uh, it's a closer translation to say, forgive us our debt, for we have also forgiven our debtors. Now, in my mind, it says when we've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we've received this gift of God's love that we did nothing for, that comes over us the way it came upon Jesus in his baptism, uh, in that moment, we have nothing against anybody and we've forgiven our debtors. So forgive us uh, as a gift. Forgive us in that way. Now, there, there begins a cycle. I, I feel like this baptism of the Holy Spirit and this process of receiving God's love and forgiving others is a cycle that we are to go through over and over again. First, when we confess our sin and come to Jesus as our Savior. Uh, many of us don't really have a moment where we felt like we were really pressured by our sins and we were afraid we were going to burn in hell and just wake up dead the next day and in hell and so we cried out in panic lord save me you died on the cross to save me but if you've ever come to jesus as he really is jesus who we see on this cross jesus who died 
as an offering for sin. Not just Jesus, uh, a, a great teacher, but Jesus, the sacrifice for sin, Jesus Christ, the Savior. If you've ever come to him, you've come as a sinner. If you've come to him, you can come near him and talk about him, but if you come to Jesus as your Savior, you've confessed your sins because nobody dies on the cross the way he did a perfect sacrifice without dying for sin. That's just the reality of who he is. So we confess our sins, like, forgive me. I don't know how to say it. I, I don't know how to express it, but I'm a sinner and I'm receiving your salvation. I have faith. And then the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes and says, I love you and I've always loved you. And you think that there's no mathematics that make that work. No, it's a gift. I love you and I've always loved you. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. The father said, we received that. And in that moment, we uh, have this experience where nobody owes us anything because of how much we've been forgiven. And then it works out in our lives. I'm thinking of several examples of prominent Christian influencers who, after they came to Christ, went back to their abusive fathers and forgave them. It's happened. You've maybe heard those stories because when the Holy Spirit comes on you and puts that gift of a love that you've never, that, that, that doesn't really match you, doesn't match the, the way you've loved God in return, that was given to you the way the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, it stirs up a really deep forgiveness and reconciliation. And you have to go act it out. So it creates this cycle of uh, repenting and forgiving and repenting and forgiving. And, and you've forgiven, and, there, and, and from that position, you're confessing your, your debt of love to God, and God puts upon you again the message, the reality that you're loved as a gift. All right. So that's the foundation. In your practical every morning, everyday life, it, it also makes sense just to pray, Lord, I, I did this, this, and this. If you could remember something you did that was rotten the day before, good news, you got some material for this part of the Lord's Prayer. Pray it and confess it. Be honest. And uh, get better and better at being honest. It's practical. You can, pr you can uh, pray for forgiveness for the things that you remember, and you can also pray for the tendencies. Because you may say, well, I, honestly, I think I was pretty good yesterday. <laughs> I really can't think of anything I did wrong, you know. But I know my heart. I know I'm conceited. I know I'm self-centered. I know I'm slothful. There's, there's a certain part of me that wants to get out of the hard stuff. I know that I'm a little bit selfish. I don't really want to share time or energy or money or whatever it is. And you know anger and lust and you know, you know coveting. You know it all. You know the tendencies as well as the practices. So you can confess that. Lord, that's still my tendency. But also confess the foundational. I owe you a debt of love that I haven't paid. And so essentially the invitation today is to come back to your first love. Have you ever seen anybody that became a Christian just kind of in a surprise way? Wow, I'm a Christian. Just, uh, I, I, I was completely in the world, and then I found Jesus, and I'm so excited. When I delivered pizzas in Washington State right after I got my expensive bachelor's degree, uh, I met this guy, and somehow we started talking about God, and he said, man, when I get off of work, all I want to do is go home and read the Bible. I said, me too, <laughs> you know? Like, we're, people would think we're crazy. You've seen somebody in that state? That's first love. Book of Revelation, again, talks about these churches. They're doing all these great things, and he says to one church, I have this one thing against you. You've lost your first love. God wants us to be in love with him. And love is when you're kind of crazy. Instead of walking, you're dancing, and everything sounds like music. The fingernails against the blackboard just sound great whatever it is you're just so happy you got somebody's attention and they've got yours and everything's going to come up roses uh, the lord is calling us to love him and be loved in a way that's fresh a first love and we're invited to it every day every day 
So, uh, Lydia, I don't know if you could do this favor for me, but there's a prayer in there that is a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. And I want to first ask the expert Christians in the room, the people who have led others to Christ, who've been faithful thick and thin, who've tithed till your wallet wore thin, you know the Bible, you know the Old Testament and the New Testament, people depend on you. You're known as a woman of God, as a man of God. You, your faith is the number one thing in your life. I want to call you to start brand new, to put in a quarter into the machine and start as if you have nothing and say, Lord, I owe you 